Welcome back, uh, students, to your morning class again. The other day in the last class, uh, we have uh, learned why reproduction is necessary, and we have learned what are the different types of reproduction, like asexual reproduction, then vegetative reproduction, and sexual reproduction. So uh, we know the differences between asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. Asexual is one where there's no formation and no fusion of gametes, while in sexual reproduction, there is formation and there's fusion of gametes. So all organisms, uh, all organisms, be it plants or be it animals, those who reproduce sexually, they follow a uh, precise sequence of events. And this sequence of events are brief fertilization events, then the fertilization event, and the post-fertilization event. So these three stages we have learned a little bit uh, in the last class, but today let's see a little more into these three uh, events of uh, sexual reproduction. The first is the uh, pre-fertilization event. So this pre-fertilization events includes all the events or all the activities before uh, the, form uh, the fusion of the gametes. So these events are the uh, formation of the uh, gametes and the transfer of the gametes. So uh, as we have learned that uh, the gametes that are involved in sexual reproduction are the male or the, the male gamete or the sperm and the female gamete or the egg or the ovum. So these uh, sexual units or the sex cells, the sperm is produced in the testis and the egg or the ovum is produced in the ovary. So uh, prior to fertilization or prior to the fusion of these gametes, the sex cells have to be formed in their respective reproductive uh, uh, structures. And likewise, these uh, uh, sex cells or the gametes, they are, the sperm is formed in the male parent and the uh, egg or the ovum is formed in the female parent. And so like as you will look into the living organisms, in some organisms, the a single parent may have both the testes and the ovary. Or in other words, a single parent may have both the reproductive structures. For example, the earthworm. The earthworm has both the testes as well as the ovary. But when you look into human beings, the male has got the testes while the female, the ovary, is present in the uh, female parent. So in human beings, or for example, uh, for that matter, even in the reptiles and other mammals, the uh, sexual reproductive structures are present in different individuals. So these individuals, they are called as unisexual uh, uh, organisms, while the adworms, they are termed as uh, uh, bisexual organisms. Or for that matter, even when we look into the plants, we see that there are certain plants which have only the male reproductive structure, and while the other plant has the female reproductive structure. For example, the papaya plant. We see that some papaya plants, they keep on flowering, 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 they never bear fruit. But there are certain papaya plants which bear the flower and they produce the fruits. So those papaya plants where they produce flowers but they do not bear uh, fruits, they are the male or uh, the male plant, while the plant which bears the flower and produce the fruits are the female parent. Or for even for that matter, we look into the fruit that we, uh, we all love to eat, the kiwi plant. The, in, even in kiwi, the male and the female plants are separated. They are present in different individuals. So they are called as unisexual plants. But majority of the flowering plants, uh, they, both the male and female reproductive structures are present in one individual. So we call that as bisexual flower. So with that, the sperms are formed in the respective reproductive structures, be it unisexual or be it bisexual organisms. So after the formation, the next is for the sperms to get transferred from the, male, uh, from the male animal or from the male parent to the female parent. In the, and after the transfer of the sperm to the female parent, now the next step is the fertilization which takes place. Fertilization is the fusion of the sperm and the egg, which results in the formation of the zygote. And it is also known as syngamy. So there are organisms where fertilization takes place within the body. For example, the human beings, fusion of the egg and the sperm takes place inside the female body. And further developments takes place inside the female body. 
and those organisms they are called as or that type of fertilization is called as internal fertilization but there are certain organisms where fertilization takes place in the environment for example the frog they lay the eggs and the male bring the sperms and they fertilize it in the water so that type of fertilization is called as external fertilization so uh, fusion of the egg and the sperm takes place and it results in the development of the zygote and the zygote further develops into the embryo and the embryo now develops into the individual and where the cycle is repeated again. So in post-fertilization even, the development of the embryo from the zygote takes place. In organisms where uh, fertilization takes place inside the body, uh, the best example is the human beings, uh, we are called as viviparous organisms where we give birth to the young ones directly. But on the other hand, as you look into the, some animals like the poultry birds, poultry or the birds, fertilization no doubt takes place in the body of the female parent, but further development of the zygote into the embryo takes place outside in the form of they lay the eggs outside. Fertilization takes place within inside the body of the hen, but they lay the egg and outside uh, further development of the zygote into the embryo, into the chicken takes place outside in the environment. So those types of uh, animals, they are called as oviparous uh, animals or organisms. So with this basic knowledge and with this basic idea, let's take ourselves further uh, into one step and let's look detailly into the sexual reproduction in flowering plants, uh, which is your second chapter. Okay, let's see now into the flowering plants. Okay, so, uh, Sexual reproduction in flowering plants, uh, you have learned about the morphology of flowering plants, uh, flower in your theory in class 11. So also you have done this in your practical and you must be familiar with the structure of a flower in detail uh, or you can bring an imaginary picture of your favorite flower. Anyway, let's look into the detailed structure and how the flower reproduces sexually. Okay. Uh, a typical bisexual flower, it consists of the sepal, the petal, the stamen, and the pistil or the uh, carpel. Okay, the sepal and the petal are called the uh, non-essential hole or the accessory holes, while the stamen and the pistil, they are called the reproductive holes or the uh, essential holes. So in flower, uh, the Stamen and the pistil, these are the two structures which takes part in uh, sexual reproduction. The stamen is called the male reproductive structure and the pistil or the carpal is the female reproductive structure. And a typical stamen consists of a filament, a slender stalk, the filament by means of which it is attached to the thalamus, the swollen base which uh, holds all the floral parts and a terminal bilobe structure called the anther, and in the anther are produced uh, thousands of pollen grains. And a typical pistil or carpal consists of a stigma, uh, a receptive surface known as the stigma, a slender portion called the style, and a swollen base called the ovary. So this ovary the style and the stigma, they constitute the female reproductive structure. And within the ovary, within the ovary is the ovule. And this ovule encloses the embryo sac. The ovule encloses the embryo sac. And the embryo sac in turn encloses eight cells which takes part in sexual reproduction. On the whole, this Embryo sac is surrounded by one or two integuments and the ovule is attached to the placenta by a structure known as the funicle and the point of attachment of the ovule with the uh, embryo sac with the ovule, uh, um, of the ovule with the funicle is called the helium and there is a small opening here at the, this micropylar end called the micropyle and the opposite to this end is called the chalazal end.
So this is a detailed structure of the female reproductive structure in uh, flowering plants. So uh, the development of the pollen grain, the po development of the pollen grain in the anther and the development of the embryo stick takes place simultaneously. They take place simultaneously. And uh, during the development of the pollen grain in the anther, the uh, cells undergo meiotic, the microspore mother cells undergo meiotic division to give rise to pollen grains. And on the maturation of these pollen grains, the enter the highs, the enter breaks open and they are released into the environment. While on the other hand, uh, this embryo sac, the embryo sac which encloses the, uh, which is also called the female gametophyte, encloses the eight nuclei. There are eight nuclei inside the embryo sac. Three of these, they are arranged at the chalazal end and it forms the uh, antibodal cells. Then two in the middle of the cell of the embryo sac called the polar nuclei. And at the micropylar end, there are two synergies and an egg cell. So this is uh, the female gametophyte which takes part in reproduction, uh, sexual reproduction. So, now, uh, this, once the pollen grains are formed in the enter, and these pollen grains are uh, microscopic, they are spherical, and they uh, are the carriers of the sperms. They are the carriers of the male uh, gametes or the sperms. So once they are formed in the enter, the next step is the transfer of these pollen grains. They, in order for fertilization to take place or sexual production to take place, these pollen grains have to be transferred, have to be carried from this anther to this stigma. So, who does the job of carrying the pollen grain from the anther to the stigma? There has to be certain factors, there has to be certain factors which will carry this pollen grains from the anther to the stigma. The many of the plants, uh, not many of the plants, the plants are stationary. The plants are stationary, they are immobile, they are fixed to a substratum, and the anther will not go in search of the egg, but the enter which produces the sperms or uh, uh, enclosed in the pollen grains, they have to travel from this position and they have to reach this stigma. They have to reach travel from the enter to the stigma and that phenomenon is known as pollination. Pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the enter to the stigma of a flower. So uh, in plants where both male and female both male and female are present, that type of pollination is called as autogamy. But in plants, as I've cited the example of uh, uh, papaya and kiwi and all, where uh, a plant has either the male, has either the stamen or either the carpal, the transfer of pollen grain from the anther to, from the anther of the male flower to the stigma of the female flower, that type of pollination is known as cross pollination. And in case of cross-pollination, the transfer is brought about by certain pollinating agents, certain agencies. And those agencies uh, which brings about pollination are the uh, insects, particularly the bees, uh, then the birds, then uh, a body factor like uh, wind, then water, even the bats, they bring about the transfer of pollen grains from the enter to the stigma. So now, once the pollen grains land on the stigma, the pollen grain has, uh, is the care of the sperm. The pollen grain is the care of the two sperms. So the nucleus of the pollen grain, a typical uh, pollen grain look like this. It consists of two cells, a vegetative cell and a generative cell, and this generative cell divides, the nucleus of the generative cell divides to give rise to the sperms. And these are the units which takes part in sexual reproduction. So upon landing on the stigma, in order to reach, in order for the sperms to reach the egg, a prerequisite is for the pollen grains to germinate. They have to germinate and they have to travel all the way through the style and then it has to reach the egg which is inside the embryo sac. So this pollen grain, they secrete, they absorb the su uh, sugary substances present on the stigma and they germinate. They germinate by, pull, uh, by putting out tubes known as 
the pollen tube, and this pollen tube makes their journey, makes their way through the style, and finally into the embryo by producing enzymes which digest the cell of the style and making its way into the uh, ovule, finally into the embryo sac with the two sperms. So upon reaching the embryo sac, upon reaching the embryo sac, the pollen tube first enter into the synergies. These are these two cells. These two cells are the first to uh, one of these two synergies is the first to receive the pollen tube. So this pollen tube with the two sperms now discharge its content. It discharge its content, discharge its sperms into this synergy. The two sperms are now discharged into the synergy. And during the process of fertilization, one of the two sperm, one of the two sperms, they fuse with this egg. Oh, one of the two sperms, they go and fuse with this egg, bringing about the development of the, or the formation of the, the zygote. So, of the two sperms that are released into the synergies, one sperm fused with the egg, and the fertilization product of the egg and the first sperm is called the zygote, and the second sperm go and fuse with this polar nuclei, which already consists of two cells. So this fertilization product of the second sperm and the two polar nuclei results in the formation of primary endosperm nucleus. So since um, there are two fertilization, there are two fertilization taking place. One is the fertilization of the first sperm with the egg and that fertilization is called the zygote, or fertilization product is called the zygote, and the second fertilization, uh, which takes place between the second sperm and the two polar nuclei, is uh, resulting in the formation of secondary and endosperm nucleus. Since there are two fertilization taking place at the same time, the phenomenon is known as double fertilization. So the phenomenon is for double fertili is called as double fertilization. First fertilization between the first sperm and the egg, and the second fertilization between the second sperm and the two polar nuclei, and the phenomenon is called as double fertilization. And this double fertilization is a characteristic feature of the angiosperms only. This double fertilization is found only in case of flowering plants, and it is not found in the gymnosperms, it's not found in the bryophytes, it's not found in the pteridophytes, or it's not found even in the algae, but it's found only in the uh, angiosperms, and this double fertilization is a characteristic feature of the angiosperms. So now, there's another phenomenon known as triploid, uh, triple fusion. So in this, uh, during the formation of the embryo sac, or during the formation of the uh, female gametophyte, total, in total there are eight cells or uh, egg nuclei. So three arranged to form the egg apparatus and three arranged to form the antipodals while, so, while two from each side, two from each side come and fuse in the middle. Two out of the eight cells, three organize to form the antipodals and three organize to form the uh, egg apparatus while one from each corner, one from this side and the uh, one, cell, one cell from this side comes and fuse in the middle forming the polar nuclei. So in this case, there is the first, this is the first cell or first nucle uh, nucleus, second nucleus, so resulting in the formation of polar nuclei. And the third one, the, uh, uh, the sperm with one nuclei comes and fuse, making it resulting in the formation of three Nuclei. And this, since there is a uh, fusion of three nucleus, three uh, nucleus, this phenomenon is known as triple fusion. So, triple fusion and uh, double fertilization are the two phenomena that are characteristics of angiosperms. And uh, this zygote, 
After the fertilization uh, is over, the zygote develops into the embryo, and this primary endosperm develops into the endosperm. So during the process of uh, germination, these endosperms, they serve as a nutrition for this developing embryo. During the germination of the pollen grains, uh, during the germination of the seeds, the endosperm give nutrients to the developing embryo and the embryo gets all its nourishment from the endosperm. And as, as this development are taking place inside this, this whole development, this whole fusion, triple fusion, double fertilization, these events are taking place inside this. So in due course of its development, the other parts like the petal, the sepal, or the enter, they wither and they fall off. They wither and they fall off, leaving this pistil only. So this ovule or the, uh, the whole structure, it undergoes hormonal changes, it undergoes uh, various kinds of changes, and this ovary develops into the fruit of the plant, the ovule develops into the seed, the embryo encloses, which encloses the embryo and the endosperm, while the integuments forms the seed coat. So post-fertilization events includes the uh, maturation of the ovary into the fruit, the ovule develops into the seed, while the embryo sac, which encloses the ovary and the endosperm, the embryo develops into a new individual plant, and during its germination of the seed, the endosperm provides all its nutrients to the developing embryo, while the integuments form, uh, develop into the seed cord. So these are some of the changes which takes place after fertilization. And interestingly, uh, in this and in this type of uh, fruit development, where the fruit develops from a single ovary that is called as true fruits. A true fruit is one which develops from an ovary, and uh, there are fruits like apple or the strawberries where the other parts also. Uh, helps in the development, where the other accessory parts also takes uh, part in the development of the fruit, and that those kind of fruits they are known as false fruits. So depending upon whether the ovary which matures into the fruit, it develops from the ovary, from the ovary alone, it's called as true fruit, or when other, when even the other accessory parts like the sepal or the petal or even maybe even the uh, end, uh, stamen, they help in the formation of the fruit, it's called as false fruits. So once the fruit is matured, it is shed off, it is consumed, and the seed is again, the seed which develops from the ovule is sown to the soil or to the ground where it germinates, where the ovary germinates and then it repeats the whole cycle of uh, sexual reproduction in flowering plants again. So uh, in all this, um, there are various agencies. Various agencies are required to bring about pollination. Various agencies are required to bring about uh, the transfer of the pollen grains from the enter to the stigma. Without that, pollination, without that fertilization will not take place. Without the transfer of the pollen grains from the anther to the stigma, then the germination of the pollen grain, and subsequently its uh, journey to the uh, embryo sac, without that, fertilization will not take place. But there are cases where a fruit can develop even without fertilization. A fruit can develop without even being fertilized, without the sperm. The ovary can develop into a fruit without even the uh, fusion of the sperms with the contents of the embryo sac. And that phenomenon is known as, and those fruits are known as parthenogenic fruits. So these parthenogenic fruits are those fruits which develops without the fertilization of the egg or the 
uh, polar nuclei. Uh, for example, uh, banana and grapes, those are the examples of parthenogenic fruits, and these fruits, uh, they, fertilization does not take place. Fertilization or the fusion of the egg and the sperm does not take place in these fruits, and they are called as par parthenogenic fruits, and the phenomenon is known as parthenogenesis. So, on the whole, uh, when you look into a particular fruit like uh, pea fruit or gram, uh, pea, uh, pea seed or gram seed, you find that there is a hard covering. You find that there is a hard covering, and uh, often in the school we used to eat that. We peel the hard covering and then we eat the inside for gram or chana and motor or the pea. So that covering is this. This integuments is uh, the seed coat, the hard covering of the pea seed or the gram seed is because of the development of these integuments in forming into the hard seed coat. So, uh, and you, usually we find a small opening. Usually we find a small opening at one of the end. At one end, a pea seed may look like this, and usually one small minute opening is present that is called the micropyle. So it is at this micropyle where water and nutrients will enter, or water and uh, oxygen will enter the seed during the process of germination. So as you study this, as you learn this, uh, as you go through your textbook with this, please bring along with some uh, materials, bring along some uh, seeds or fruits so that you'll have a better uh, idea or will you have a better uh, understanding of the subject. So on the whole, uh, this whole process of um, development takes place uh, in, in some plants, it may take place for some weeks, it may take place for some months, uh, in some plants it may take place, it may take uh, for some uh, weeks or months or, or uh, it may go on for that, or go, go for a long period of time. For example, uh, in plants, uh, where the seed is formed and the seed usually undergoes a period of dormancy before germinating. The seed undergoes a period of rest before uh, germinating, before uh, the embryo starts germinating. And that period of rest is known as dormancy. So after overcoming the period of dormancy, the seeds germinate and the ovule starts, the embryo starts germinating and the en embryo develops the zygote, uh, the embryo which develops from the zygote gives rise to a new individual plant, a uh, new individual flower, or new individual vegetable, or new individual uh, kind of tree, and repeats the whole cycle again. So as you study, please bring a comparative study of asexual. Uh, in case of asexual reproduction, there is no formation and there is no fusion of gametes. But in case of uh, sexual reproduction, there is formation of uh, gametes taking place uh, in the pollen grain in case of the flowering plants. And there's a formation of the egg taking place inside the ovary in case of uh, these flowering plants. While in case of the animals, uh, the sperms, they are formed in the uh, testes and the uh, egg is formed in the ovary. So the product of sexual and asexual reproduction, they also differ. In asexual reproduction, the individuals, the individuals are identical to the parent. They are exactly, they are morphologically, genetically identical to the parent. While in case of uh, sexual reproduction, they are the offsprings or the product of the fusion. They are not uh, identical to the parent genetically. And sexual reproduction helps in evolution because of variation. And this variation is because of exchange of uh, genetic material during the process of meiosis in crossing over. And uh, sexual reproduction is an uh, elaborate, uh, complex uh, process. It's an elaborate, complex, it's an, a slow process, while uh, sexual reproduction is relatively or simple uh, process. While uh, sexual, asexual reproduction does not help in, uh, does not help in uh, evolution, unlike sexual reproduction, Sexual reproduction helps in uh, evolution, while asexual reproduction does not help in uh, evolution because uh, of the involvement of only mitosis. So, um, 
In case of flowering plants, it is not only this. It's not only, this is not only the means of reproduction. This is not only the means of uh, to replicate or to propagate. We have discussed about uh, uh, vegetative reproduction, like cutting. Uh, we have discussed about uh, uh, layering, grafting. Uh, they can be even propagated through uh, uh, roots, tuberous roots. Then they can be propagated through stems, and they also can be propagated even through the leaves. So uh, flowering plants, they can uh, they reproduce both sexually as well as uh, sexually by means of fusion of uh, the egg and the sperm, and they reproduce or they propagate vegetatively through the roots, stem, leaves, and even through cutting, grafting, and layering, which are some artificial methods. While in uh, the lower uh, animal kingdom or the lower plant kingdom, the major modes of uh, reproduction is the asexual method by means of fission, butting, then fragmentation, then uh, sporulation, or for, for formation of even the zoospores. So as you study this, bring a comparative uh, uh, study, bring a comp comparison about uh, sexual and asexual. What are the differences between asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction? What is vegetative reproduction? In plants, the term asexual reproduction is replaced by vegetative propagation or vegetative reproduction. So as you study, please bring a sample of a flower, look into the detailed structure, bring a sample of a fruit, look into the structure, or bring uh, the sample of a seed, look into the structure, which will give you a more in-depth and which will stay uh, in your head for a longer period of time. With that, uh, I conclude uh, the class, and with that, we conclude our first unit, reproduction in organisms, reproduction in flowering plants, and with that, we have finished seven marks, and we're left with the bigger units later on. Thank you.